Hello everyone, this is Sam Spade with another tutorial in the Buttons Design and Game Maker Studio 2.3 series. In this tutorial, we'll be adding a little bit of depth to our buttons, and we'll be doing it in 2.25. Before we add anything, I want to review what we did last time. We created a very simple button that waits for input. When it gets input, it acts, and when it finishes acting, it goes back to waiting for input. We also created a very basic inheritance structure for our button. We have our button class up at the top, then we have different interact types which inherit from the class, and then we have our actual buttons down here which inherit from the various interact types. We're spending a little bit of each of these tutorials talking about design, so I just want to make some quick notes on the basics of models, or the basics of diagrams, of modeling your code. When you want to diagram or model something, these are three things uh, which I didn't come up with, but that I think are very helpful to keep in mind. First, that your model should be a representation of the thing and not the thing itself. Second, that it should be a reduction. It should not capture all of the data about the object you're modeling. And finally, that it should be useful. If we go back to our state machine, this is clearly not the button itself. It's also a reduction. It doesn't have everything that the button has in its model, but it is useful. It allows us to see within a few seconds everything important about how we interact with our button, and remember that for later. So with that, the two things that we're gonna work on in this tutorial are creating buttons that can be active or inactive, and that have a selecting or a hover state. They will change when the mouse pointer is over them. Now, uh, let's switch over to code. All right, let's start by making it so our buttons can be active or inactive. Since we want this to apply to all buttons, we're going to do this in the button parent, we're going to come over here to variable definitions and we're going to add the variable active. We're going to make it a boolean and we're going to default it to true. Next, we're going to come up here and we're going to add event user zero. I know we're already using event user zero in our other buttons and our actual buttons, but I'll change that in a moment. We're going to say this is the active check for our button parent. And it's just going to say if active, event user one. And now I'm going to change all of these to event user one, and I'm just going to speed up for a moment so I can get done quickly. Okay, so I finished changing everything. And now what you should be able to see is a nice structure where our interact parent calls event zero, and then this does a check. And if it's active, the button is active, it then calls event user1, which is what we want for our actual button. If we were to run this, we should find that nothing has changed in our program. So if I click on this, we get hello world, how are you, goodbye. And I forgot for one moment, but let's actually make all of these children of the single tap parent. So everything still works. I think it is worth pausing here for a moment and talking about why I used event zero instead of a different event number. You can actually do anything you wanted. For me, I think that it is easier to conceptualize going from zero to one to two, even if that means having to go update my buttons. And you'll see as we do more complicated buttons, we might even get to two or three or four going down, but you could just as easily set it up so that zero is always what the actual button uses and maybe five or something like that is what the active check uses so that you don't actually have to go in and change those things as you update it. All of this will go away when we get to 2.3 and can actually name our methods. Now the next thing that we want to do is add in a hover state. Again, I'm going to do this in the button parent. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say when the mouse enters, we have mouse enter, we're going to say hover which for us will just mean making the button slightly larger. And we'll do that by directly adjusting the scale. Let's just say 1.2. And now when we leave, we just need to reset it. We'll call this unhover. So we have mouse enter where we hover and mouse leave where we unhover. 
And then we have our active check. These are all on the button parent because we want every button to have that. And if we come down here, we can see that now every single button has all of these events. Let's run this one more time to check the hover. But before we do that, let's actually go to our room over here and set up one of these buttons to be inactive. Let's say the goodbye button is going to be inactive. We come down here to variables, come over here and we just uncheck it. Now let's run our code. Okay, so we can see that when our mouse goes over a button, it enters a different state, gets a little bit larger. And we can still say, hello world, how are you? But now, hopefully you can hear my mouse clicking. Doesn't matter what we do, this button is inactive and we can't click on it. We'll add some sounds in our next video to make this interaction a little bit more obvious, both for selecting and for tapping. One thing I wanna say about the way I've structured the code here before I move on is that there are many different ways we could have done it. Not only could we have changed the user event, but for example, the mouse enter and mouse leave, we could have made their own object, which inherit from button parent, which then tap button and double tap inherit from. And this would make it easier to have some buttons not have the hover state and other buttons have the hover state. Right now, all buttons have to have the hover state. But this goes to something I covered in the first tutorial, which is not creating needless complexity and really only writing code that you need. It's tempting to think that maybe down the road, I'll separate the hover state from the button parent. And maybe that will happen. But right now, I actually know that I don't want that. And I don't need to create needless complexity for myself by creating more objects than I actually want or actually will use just to cover all eventualities. Right now, I'm trying to create a very simple button that can be active or inactive that will be different if you're hovering over it or not hovering over it and will allow you to easily switch up how you are interacting with it, whether it's tapping, double tapping, I can make it a mouse click or something else. And this is really all you need to do in order to do that. So I'm not gonna make my code more complex just because I might want to do something else later. Before we finish, I wanna go over our diagrams, which I've already updated. First, we have a slightly more complex diagram of our button state. Now, we have not selected and selected, where the state changes based upon whether the mouse enters or the mouse leaves. And then we have acts, and then it goes back to being finished acting. And we also have a guard clause over here, so the input will actually only transfer us to the act section if the button is active. If it's not active, then this won't fire. So if our button is in the selected state and we give it its input, but it's not active, it's just gonna stay in the selected state. It won't be able to come over here. I've also updated our inheritance structure to include just a little bit more information. Again, like we said at the start, whenever you're modeling something, you are going to leave out information. So maybe the prior diagram with less information was actually more helpful, but I've decided to include this here. And I think that this helps me a little bit see what our buttons are actually doing. Also, this isn't a UML course, but I am using some basic UML notations. I do have a link to the UML class diagram uh, at the end or down below, uh, which might be worth watching to, to get one idea of how you could model something like this. But we have our basic inheritance structure, just like before. Again, these are a little bit different right now. They're actually all children of tap button parent. And then we have our variable. So our button parent has one variable, which again, it's passing down through its inheritance chain, and that is active. And it has a couple of events, which it's also passing down through its inheritance chain. But then these interact parents have their interact events. And finally, our buttons down here have their event user one. So you can see that this button will inherit the tap gesture event and all of these, as well as this variable, and these buttons would have the double tap gesture event and all of these. And something like this can be very useful if you leave your project or this portion of your project alone for three months, let's say, or four months, five months, and then come back and wanna make some changes. Giving you the ability to, at a glance, see how everything is set up, or maybe, you want to pass your project along to someone else, turn it into an asset, something like that. Again, these types of diagrams can be a very useful way of passing that information to other people. In summary, diagrams can be useful in keeping everything in your code straight. You shouldn't create needless complexity. And how you structure things should be directly related 
to what you want to do. So you may not actually want to use the structure that I'm using in this tutorial series if you want to do something a little bit different. There's a link to some basics about UML class diagrams. If you'd like to learn more about one way of modeling code, uh, which I think is a short video and worth checking out. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching.